You're listening to TFM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome to TFM's local watering hole, and I am just one of your hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and I am so excited to be back with you, Uh, and of course with me, as she is every single week, is the incredibly bewitching Christy Morris. Hello. Uh, uh, Did you need to clear your throat, Christy? Are you okay there? (coughs) Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Sorry. It's a it it's a really grimy watering hole that we're at this week. <laughs> There's some something going on. Don't even think about trying to escape. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh man. Well, I'm I'm excited because um we are back in the Witcher universe today. We're going to be talking about the uh animated prequel that came out called Nightmare of the Wolf. But before we dive into that, you can find us, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. If you happen to be on Twitter, follow us over at the 602 Club. If you're on Instagram, at the 602 Club TFM. We're on Letterboxd under the 602 Club. You can also find us online at trek.fm. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. We've also got the listeners only discussing group on Facebook called the Babel Conference that you can join. And you can talk to listeners from all over the world. And if uh, you know you're uh, listening to this podcast, just make sure you're subscribed wherever you are getting your podcast, and that lets you get every single episode as soon as it drops. Plus, head over to Apple Podcasts if you're using any of the Apple systems there, and give us a star rating review and help people find the show. Written reviews really make a difference, and uh, it's been a while since we've gotten one. We'd love to read your review out and thank you for that. So, um. Christy, uh, one of the things that, you know, I had seen that this had come out in August and I was so busy, I hadn't had a chance to even think about watching this until we got to to now. And I honestly didn't read anything about it before we watched it. Like I, I sat down, I watched mm-hmm. it, like I didn't really know, you know, what part of the story this was or how it was going to connect And I think my favorite thing about this is how it is a prequel and it gives us the Witcher history. Like it really helps explain the background of this universe. And and to me, that's the thing that really made this exciting as we got into it. I was like, oh, that's what we're going to do in this. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm similar to you as far as how I came into this. It was something that I saw was going to be coming soon. And I would say usually I'm not super into anime in general, but this one kind of piqued my interest some because the animation quality looked so good. Um, and then also being part of this universe, I was curious about how it would fit in or if it was just a totally different spin off story of one character or something. So I was also glad to see it was a prequel. Um, And for people that haven't read the book either or books, I think it's multiple books, um, you know, like me, it would help to have this kind of thing as well. And that's probably what they were thinking of initially doing it for. I mean, and I I have to say that for me, I, I feel like it really did help me because, you know, as much as they're able to do in the first season, which they do a lot because it spans a very large span of time in that show, as we talked about, mm-hmm. you know, it has the back and forth between the different time periods uh, and it kind of progressively catches everybody up till the same time period. Well, here it's a pretty linear story, uh, even though we're going kind of back and forth between Vesemir's childhood and the quote unquote now. And what I really Mm -hmm. liked about that is that, you know, this gives us the history of the world we're going to be in with Geralt, 
by showing us why there are not very many witchers left in the right. universe that Geralt in, in, is in. And also giving us a taste of who the person is that would be his mentor. And to me, that was a really exciting thing to see, while at the same time, again, just kind of broadening the universe that we're in with the Witcher universe. If if you haven't read the books, and I've only read the first one, so I'm not familiar with, with as much of it as I could be. I just haven't had a chance to really dive into that universe. I've been in other universes. And so <laughs> I really appreciated... Um, this uh, for the fact that we were going to spend a lot of time here with this universe and and just, again, opening it up. I thought it was really cool. Well, and they're telling you things like the tests that they go through as kids to then ultimately become Mm -hmm. full-fledged witchers. And that, like you said, like the reason that there's not very many is because the tests and then also later the other jobs they'll do sometimes take their life you know that this is a serious business it's not like they're just having a great time killing easy monsters for easy money yeah so i like they showed that too i absolutely agree i really appreciated the the rat i really appreciated the way the this movie showed how difficult it is to become a witcher you know that that not many people even survived the training back then in the first place and to survive it it takes a really incredible person you know and uh i was i I really liked that i thought it, it added a lot so that again as we're watching the Witcher series, and you're getting to know the the Geralt character. I think that's really fascinating, and and also, I mean, it just kind of helps show why there are a lot of people in that series that don't trust Witchers. You know why? But and and mm-hmm. it also makes sense as to why they've kind of become, unless you run into one, because there are so few of them. They're kind of these like almost like myths and legends, you know, until you might run into one. And so, I, again, I just yeah. this does a really great job of of doing the work of helping explain that universe. But at the same time, like, even though this is giving us all this history, I really do think that at the same time, this movie does a great job of standing up on its own and telling its own story. Uh, even though it's fitting into the larger story of what we've already seen. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, I do love how they fit it in as well by showing that it, this is someone, Vesemir, someone that we've already met in the live action Witcher series. And we know that he's Geralt's mentor, but this is his story showing then how we end up where we do in the live action series with Vesemir. Um And I really like how the creators even um, in a media interview talked about how they came up with the plot here and how to not upset any long term fans of The Witcher by deviating, but also find a story that would fit well together. Um, And so the creators of this movie were actually fans as well and said, you know, I thought to myself, if it would piss me off as a fan, then I wouldn't want to write something like that. Yeah, which is, you know, I I think just phenomenal and the complete opposite of uh, what we're seeing right now here. If you happen to be watching the Wheel of Time series over on uh, Amazon, which is a total debacle. Uh, when it comes to the source material and how they're treating it. Um, I mean, I don't want to say they're pooping all over it, but they're pooping all over it. So um, that's a whole other podcast. But um, no, I, I, I'm i glad you said that too, because I mean, this what is great about this is that if you have watched the Witcher series, this is worth a watch because it does help inform that series. But, even mm-hmm. if you've never seen that, I think that this is a really fun and engaging, you know, anime movie in the universe that 
stands on its own. Like, it tells a, a really interesting story, and it was a lot of fun, you know, to follow, you know, Vesemir on his journey. And I, I thought... I was really surprised because, you know, I mean, I kind of went into this thinking, oh, this is probably going to be more like, you know, the DC animated movies and stuff. And I don't know necessarily if that means that it would have a lot of great thematic or, you know, like resonance to it. And yet, you know, I, you know, a lot of what we've talked about in the show really played out, I think, here where, you know, fear is a really the, the main motivating factor for people on every side. Um, and I just the how mm -hmm. fear can give us the rationale to do really bad things. And every major faction in this film is being driven by some kind of fear. Right. Like the witchers leaders are saying that they decided to create more monsters because their fear is that, humanity will kill off witchers if there aren't other monsters for witchers to take care of um because witchers are different witchers are mutants so you know they they're feared af afraid for their survival mm -hmm. if they don't do this and then you also have tetra who is we find out later the product of the story she tells vesemir that um her mother was killed because a witcher made a con with somebody. Um, and so she's afraid of witchers and thinks that they are never to be trusted. She says they're, they're all corrupt. And then lastly, you know, we've got the people um, that are caught in the middle. We have um, Kitsu who's basically running away from everything and then they chase her down. Um, she is, not necessarily good because obviously they found out she's also trying to make mutated creatures and ends up killing a bunch of girls in the process. Um, but she's also afraid of being alone. I think, I don't know if you got the same vibe, but like her specifically, I feel like she was trying to make more creatures like her so that she wouldn't be alone. Yeah. That's a really good pull. I think, I think you're right in, in many ways. You know, you have this creature who has been created and has nobody like them and wants somebody else like them and or somebody mm -hmm. to accept them for who they are and not just what they can do, you know? like And, and I think, you know, like you said, you know, Kitsu and her kind being caught in the middle, they're created to be these beings for other reasons you know like you said the witchers creating these monsters as um job security and you know and it what's 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 really interesting is how everybody in the movie has a valid point of view that's interesting like they have good points in the sense mm -hmm. you know the witchers being fearful that people wouldn't value them anymore if there weren't any monsters for them to fight because they are different and that they would be killed off is not an invalid point of view, you know? Um, yeah. Tetra, you know, fearing witchers because she's seen them use their power for their own gain at the expense of others and even others' lives makes complete sense. And mm -hmm. then, like, you know, you, we were saying about Kitsu, I, no choice in the matter. Like, is created, had nothing to do with it, you know, has absolutely no choice in the matter, and just kind of gets caught in the middle between these warring factions. And it it really just goes to show, like, fear can help us rationalize doing really bad things because we don't feel like we have any other choice in the matter. And that's mm -hmm. not true. And and what I really like about this is that, you know, we do see a Vesemir make the right choice, right? We, we see him mm -hmm. um, being willing to do the right thing for the right reason and trying to save as many lives as possible, regardless of the fear involved. And, and what I, to me, that really stood out because it was like, 
we see this is this character in the beginning and it feels like money is everything to him and that's all that matters and really money mm-hmm. isn't everything and what truly ends up driving him in the end became one what's right and two love of somebody other than himself and oh definitely i really appreciated that um those two things are what we see kind of turn this character from being somebody who and on the surface looked like they only cared about money to being somebody who was willing to like he was willing to bring down his entire order of witchers if everybody was on the side of creating more monsters just for the sake of their own survival like that's not what he was mm-hmm. he was he he didn't sign up for that and i thought that was awesome yeah yeah i mean you you definitely called it with his transformation as a person um i think that it's interesting um just one little other thing to tap on the fear aspect um that when he's a kid first going through the trials of becoming a witcher he says i just think to myself i'll be stronger than ever and i won't be afraid ever again when this is done which is not true you're always going to be afraid even if you decide to face things with confidence instead you you still have some element of fear in you um whether that fear changes from fear for your own life to fear for others lives um i just thought that was interesting and then also with the money aspect yeah like he definitely at the beginning is you know sitting all sitting pretty basically in the bathtub with his money his goblet and his fruit you know and uh and then suddenly i like how they tie it to his past by him looking at the honey cake and thinking about how when he was young he had nothing and the only thing he had other than what little work he had was um iliana and that even back then he didn't realize that the most important thing in his life was her and forever chased after money and didn't realize till it was too late for him to be with her right. that she was the thing that mattered the most the whole time i i heartily agree with you because i feel like in the end what it it becomes is he is somebody who is trying to fill the void that things and money and power and all of those things could never fill you know um yeah you you can't fill your empty soul with money and all of the stuff that you can buy with it the same way you can with relationship and i think that's exactly what we see here in in I think that that is something that's really cool about the movie is watching him choose relationship, you know, to choose what is right because of being reminded that there are things more important than money. There are more important things than power. Uh, There are more important things even than self-survival, you know. Um, and mm-hmm. so being willing to sacrifice for that, I think was pretty awesome. So, and then too, I think that he, you know, in as far as the way he views the witchers making more monsters, it's interesting to see on his face, especially when he's being forced to go through all of the illusions in his mind, how he sees finally the true nature of what's going on and that it's this grotesque manipulation of people and things um you know sort of playing god you could say um that he realizes he is not on board with yes that he's like you know no matter what you're afraid of um this is not what i signed up for this is not what i stand for like i know without a doubt that's disgusting <laughs> Yeah, no, I I 100% agree with you, and I think, you know, that's a great part of, you know, this whole film is is the way that it has the convert it it talks about these things, you know, and it and it and it, I think it just mm-hmm. does a great job of showing it. Um and and that's another important thing as well. Uh and so 
something on top of that you you had mentioned uh to me was this idea of of you know having a choice or not and you know Vasimir lets Kitsu go in the end because she didn't have a choice in this. This was not her fault. Mm-hmm. She did not choose any of this. This didn't have anything to do with her. And um, you mentioned this idea about kind of juxtaposing that with Vesemir choosing the life of the Witcher. And I thought that that was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I do think you see multiple times throughout this movie, they're talking about people who did choose and didn't choose the life that they're now stuck in. And I thought that that was a really interesting way of showing how the choices you make can lead to then where you end up and that he ultimately does make the right decision in not taking Kitsu's life purely because Ileana says she didn't choose this. Right. And so it's, it's, seeing the gears turning in his head of, okay, you know, then that's clearly the way that morally I would like to go. Mm -hmm. If somebody was subjected to everything that I went through that I did choose, it's not fair to then make the decision for them as well to end their life. Uh, No, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it is a really interesting thing because, because, like you said, Vesemir makes the choice to go be in Witcher, and now he doesn't realize all of that and what it entails, but he still mm-hmm. gets to make the choice. And, right. like you said, whereas Kitsu did not, literally forced into this and has no choice of whether or not to stop or not. And so, um, and I think it's it's a reminder to us all of the complexities of the world and and that there are choices that we make and that there are choices that we don't necessarily have a choice because of the reality of you know the the world that we're in and where mm-hmm. we're raised. And I mean, there's just so many different great um, things that this can kind of, I think, allude to uh, and and do that really well. And so I think it's a, you know, it is a really good question. Um, and it is a really great moment um, because it absolutely shows exactly why uh, Vesemir can make the choice that he does about letting Kitsu live um, because yeah, she, this, this isn't, this isn't her fight and it wasn't her choice. And in many ways she's been living with the repercussions of somebody else's actions most of her life. And yet at the same time, she makes choices after that. Right. And so, right. And I think the beauty of that is seeing really the way in which Vesemir then kind of extends grace for those choices because of so many of her choices having been taken away. You know, he's not negating Mm -hmm. the other evil that she did help perpetrate, but he's also saying that that evil really in many ways comes from the choices that were thrust upon her. You know, and again, it's about mm-hmm. the the fear that lead leads her to and and the all these other things that kind of lead her down a path, uh, which makes a lot more sense when you feel completely hopeless and helpless. Yeah, no, oh, exactly. And I mean, you can see that on her face too, especially even the scene where they, they've killed her dragon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know a basilisk but i mean that was a weird dragon chicken yes, looking it was thing very strange <laughs> but she she was sad she closed its mm-hmm. eye slowly you know like losing a loved one so i thought that was interesting too to see a, a different side of yes. her yeah no i i 100 percent agree right. with you and and i think that's the thing that begins to in some ways kind of open up his eyes to the reality of the situation so I think that's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was interested to ask you, you know, 
you mentioned the fact that, you know, you're not a huge fan necessarily of anime. I know you've mentioned recently that you've kind of gotten into a little bit more of it with your husband and everything. And so how did you end up liking the animation that we got here in this film and what it allowed, you know, I guess the creators to be able to do because of the freedom of animation? I was really impressed. You know, I think that it definitely doesn't have that look of some anime that I would say I feel is more kiddish and yeah. um, silly. You know, it it makes sure that it lends itself to the seriousness of the story with the quality of the art. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, seriously, I was surprised, probably you were as well, with not knowing much going into this when it said the rating at the beginning yeah. and said for nudity <laughs> and gore. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I thought this was anime. <laughs> but at, there are anime out there. I'm looking at you, Attack on Titan. <laughs> They're pretty gory. So, yes. Um, yeah, so that automatically as well made me go, oh, this is definitely not what I thought. This is serious. Um, and I also didn't think about it from the angle as well until I was reading more of those interviews with the creators that um, they chose to go with the animation route because there's so much more you can do with the story and with your characters physically um, that you just can't do sure. with live action and, you know, with they were even saying, like, we can't have an actor holding mm-hmm. multiple swords. They're too heavy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we can't have people jumping off of mountains and stuff all the time. Well, you and know? it costs so much if you do want to do that. Right. Like it, it, you can yeah. do those things in live action these days. But the cost is enormous because you're either putting somebody on wires, which takes so much work to be able to set all that up, and then you have to edit all that out, and then you're going to have to augment it with CGI anyway, you know, or you could just do it all in an animated format, and you don't have to worry about any of that. And so, no, I, I completely get why, you know, when you're, the idea of doing a prequel, kind of filling in some backstory with everything here uh, to the world of Geralt, um, that the choice that they make is to do this in this style. And I think, you know, absolutely, this is not for kids. It's definitely very mature. No. Um, there's quite a bit of gore in it as well, which, you know, I mean, I guess animated gore, you know, it's just red ink. But, um, you know. There's eyeballs hanging out. This Come on. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, there's that exorcism scene, too, basically, that's super... Uh, violent and graphic so yeah but i what i think the animation really added to the film to me like it like all the action sequences Mm -hmm. i thought were really well done um you know the 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 magic yeah the magic was great the the you know the the cool fight scene between kitsu her basilisk uh tetra and vesemir was really awesome um, I mean, mm-hmm. the the end battle scene is really good, too. So they really utilize this to their, you know, fullest potential. And I think it works great. I really enjoyed it. And I thought it was really worth um, checking out. And, and really, they made the right choices here with the animation, I thought. You know, it's definitely kind of a more mm-hmm. classic anime style um for many that i've seen in in the same vein of of some classics like ghosts in the shell or that kind of thing but at the same time um yeah the, it really fit the world too um that they went with so yeah i really enjoyed it um mm-hmm. What did you think? Uh, was there anybody that stood out to you with the voice cast? Um there were a few uh choices in the voice cast that stood out to me just because I've I know their voices and or I've seen them in other things or heard them in other things but how did you end up liking it I thought they made some really good choices with the voice cast and I think that's something especially with um, animation that you have to make sure you've got the right voices for the right characters because that's all you have to go on other than you know the expressions that artists give the characters so um some that I recognized, it was kind of funny initially, I thought, or my husband and I both thought that Deglin 
uh, who was training Vesemir mm. was kind of sounding like Liam Neeson and then find out it's Graham McTavish yes. who is from Outlander and from the Hobbit movies. So, yep. And then, you know, also the Outlander spinoff reality show, uh, Men in Kilts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, he has done way more stuff than just that. But those are the things I know him from. And he's always really great, especially with these dramatic roles. And I think he held up the character really well here. And I think you needed mm -hmm. someone like that who was going to then turn and show you their dark side. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I also thought it was funny seeing um, two people that I did not expect to see on the voice cast list, Steve Bloom and Dee Bradley yeah. Baker. <laughs> they do some hilarious stuff. <laughs> yeah, Just, they do. Uh, you, because of the list of strange voice roles they've done mm. it's just funny to me yeah i mean it, what's funny is that you know uh steve bloom playing the tree spirit that he fights at the beginning and you know deep Robert baker basically playing the assorted animals it's so amazing how talented these guys are and of course knowing them mm -hmm. from their star wars work uh whether clone wars or rebels um so no absolutely um you know i i think the person that really stuck out to me the most and and mainly because i was just surprised to hear her voice in this um was mary mcdonnell uh who plays oh, yeah. Ileana, you know who i know the best from battlestar galactica uh and yep. so you know hearing her voice it's so distinctive but i think yeah. it was a really great choice to kind of play this you know um, this this lady uh, who you meet, who you later realize is you know the same as the little girl that you met, and uh, putting those two characters together, and you know being this person that is really the only person that Vesemir had ever loved, and you know I love it too because you know she does a great job of of I think she has a very mature voice. And Theo James, who plays Vesemir as an adult, has a younger male sounding voice. And of course, witchers age much more slowly, even though they're really the same age. Uh, and so putting mm -hmm. them together really worked. And so, yeah, I think one of the strengths here was the fact that the voice cast worked really, really well. Um, and just overall, I think it's one of the things where I, I felt like this whole thing worked together well, you know, from the animation to the story points. And even to the fact that, you know, they this movie is only an hour and like 20 minutes long, which I thought mm -hmm. was another really great point for it as well. Um and they did a really great job. But it doesn't drag exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> they they did a fantastic job of being very judicious in their storytelling to be able to tell the story of Vesemir growing up, his childhood, what he went through as a witcher, and then where we are in the present, the the frustrations of these different powers together, and how that leads into him ending up being the person who's going to train Geralt and mm -hmm. not even getting to Geralt to like the very last second of the movie. So all of this was just really well done. Yeah, I'm definitely with you. And, and I like too that honestly, I didn't know what characters would be in it before I watched it. So initially I was kind of thinking to myself, so is this supposed to be like more of Geralt's story or like I was a little confused and then eventually you, you hear the names and stuff and you figure it out. But I liked coming into it like that because then you get to really go on this journey not knowing where it's going to lead and then ending up in that final scene when he says Geralt's name and you go, ah, that's where we were yeah. leading to. Nah, no, I, I really agree with you. So I guess, I mean... One of the things, you know, shorter movie, shorter show, but for all that we talked about, I'm I'm really fascinated to see where you come down then ratings-wise. So this has 
everything I would be looking for in a good animated movie. And, you know, I didn't know that I was going to like it. Like I said, initially, I kind of hesitated about it just because of the style. But I think that this definitely proves that I need to give more of a chance to more anime (laughs) and that there are some really good writers out there um, giving great plot to the great art. So uh, I'm going to give this a four and a half out of five uh, leshies, which is that tree monster, um, because I thought that was cool. And although it was kind of gross sometimes that Mm -hmm. it really left me wanting more and um, also seeing the tie-ins to the live action stuff. I think that this is sort of like how you and I have said Rogue One did for Leia. It informs the rest of the story that you already knew. It gives you a different way of looking at it. So yeah, I four and a half for me. Yeah. Um, I, I'm right there with you with basically everything you said. You know, I think that this, I didn't really know what to expect other than going in, knowing that this was an anime and that it was in the Witcher universe, but I thought it was really good and I really enjoyed it. Like there wasn't a moment where I was bored and, and that's obviously part of, you know, doing this type of movie and have, they, they, really compact in their storytelling and i mean I, for me I, this is a clear solid four out of five witcher medallions because you know it yeah. just i i'm what it really did is it made me so excited you know that we're going back to season two soon you know and yeah. as we're recording this uh season two starts i think what in like three days or something um, four days. Mm-hmm. So I'm very excited to dive back into the world of Witcher, and this really helped. So I think this is definitely worth you know everybody checking out. But Christy, it's actually that time of the show where we do some recommendations. So what do you want to recommend to everybody this week? So I'm going with something a little different this time. It's not a book or TV show or movie, um, but rather another thing connected to The Witcher. Actually, today, Black Milk Clothing, which is out of Australia, but ships to other countries, um, they dropped their Witcher and Black Milk collection. um, And it's awesome. And I got to admit, it's more, you know, for ladies, but they have a lot of different designs that are really unique. They have things that are inspired by Yaskier called like the dandelion dress or the dandelion short overalls. Um, they have stuff inspired by Yennefer, stuff inspired by um, the Centrin flag. So I highly recommend checking out Black Milk Clothing and their new collection for The Witcher. Nice. That's awesome. So and and very cool for uh, the ladies out there who are looking to sport some sweet Witcher swag. So um, yeah. uh, for everyone this week, uh, you know, I'm actually going to recommend going in and um, I think I might have recommended this before. But, you know, from what I said about the Wheel of Time show, I, I I'm reading the fourth book right now and this is a world that I'm really enjoying the more and more I get into. And so I really do think that everybody should forget the show and read the book. It, I mean, and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, most people say, oh, the book is better than the movie or the show. And, you know, I, I can be somebody who likes both. You know, I love Lord of the Rings, the movies, and I love Lord of the Rings, the books. So, uh, but I think Wheel of Time is definitely worth checking out. And uh, so uh, over the holiday season, if you're wanting to start something epic, it is a 14 book series. Um, Ooh, that yeah. is. <laughs> so, and I'm only on book four. So I'm I'm actually planning to hopefully finish it next year. Um, it's going to be a dedicated read, but uh, I'm really excited. And again, like I'm in the fourth book right now. And uh, which is called The Shadow Rising and just really enjoying it. So I hope everybody will check that out. And uh, we've got, Christy, one more show for everybody coming up this year as we'll be talking about Spider-Man No Way Home. But if 
everybody wants to catch up with you and see what you'll and see what else you've got going on, where can they find you? You can find me, of course, on Instagram and Twitter at Bespin Bell. And then I'm also sometimes over in the Babel Conference on Facebook. And if you want to check me out when I'm not on the 602 Club, I also do a show called Sabres and Spells on the Skywalking Through Neverland Network, where my friends Amanda and Teresa and I talk about geeky stuff we don't usually get to cover. So I hope that you'll check that out as well. And you could find me all over social media under the name Matt Rushing Zero Two, Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero, all of those places. Uh, you can also, of course, find me uh, here on the network in the Six Hundred Two Club feed. You've got uh, Snyder cuts and Assembling Avengers with John Mills as we talk about the works of Zack Snyder, as well as everything in the MCU. We're walking through one thing at a time, so that's really exciting. We're just about to wrap up uh, Phase Two. Uh, so that's really cool and of course you can also find me doing the orb literary treks and warp 5 the orb is about star trek deep space 9 literary treks is about the books and the comics of star trek and warp 5 is about star trek enterprise and then over on the nerd party network and doing two different shows one is a completed show it is called owl post did that with drea kaufman we talked about every single chapter of the harry potter series one chapter at a time and of course as we're recording this actually the trailer for the secrets of dumbledore just dropped so super excited about that and i'm doing aggressive negotiations with john mills where we talk about star wars each and every week but thank you so much for joining us and toss a coin to your witcher you hear